technology, he do a lot of publication, and also the International Consultant of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. He will give us a talk on the topic of the ERG for ocular and systemic disease. Please. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak. Now, the title that I've been given, I can't cover in 15 hours, let alone 15 minutes. So I've had to cut things down a bit. And if we looked at the possibilities, we've heard about drug toxicity from Bill very elegantly, and ERGs can be used in all of these, and I'm not going to discuss them at all. If we could look at system, systemic disease with ocular complication, there's so many diseases, I can't even begin to list them. So what I'm going to do is concentrate on two much smaller details, post-surgical complications of systemic disease and paraneoplastic and autoimmune disease. Electrophysiology has the great advantage that it gives us objective assessment of function. It enables us to separate the function of the retinal cell types and layers, enables us to differentiate optic neuropathy and maculopathy, and when placed in clinical context, and this goes back to Bill's comments about taking an accurate history, it can give you an accurate diagnosis, and that enables management, prognosis, counselling, etc. But it really is important that we take the clinical context into account. Electrophysiology is complicated, there's a lot of it. Most people get frightened of it, they shouldn't. It's okay. And I'm going to concentrate really on the retina, not so much on the BEP, but the BEP will come into it. So if we just review the basic international standard recommendations for ERGs, we have four basic responses, a dim flash and a dark adapted eye, and these numbers refer to the brightness of flash, so 0 0.01 is dim, 10 is bright. And the Rod-specific ERG, the DA01, arises in the on-bipolar cells, so it gives us sensitivity within the rod system, but no specificity. The bright flash dark adapted ERG is what most people would draw if they were asked to look at an ERG and say, is this an ERG or not? They would say yes. And now we have an A wave which comes from the first receptors, B wave which comes from inner retina, from the on-bipolar cells. So this gives you specificity within the rod system. We then bring the patient back up to photopic conditions by turning on a light in the back of the Gansvar bowl, and we flash a light at 30 times a second. The temporal resolution of the rod system is poor, so this is a cone-driven response, and arises at an inner retinal level, so it gives sensitivity, not specificity. And then we use a single flash cone ERG, so there's a rod suppressing background, flash on top of that, and now we have a cone A wave coming from the cone photoreceptors and off bipolar cells, and the B wave synchronized response coming from cone on and off by polar cells. The full field ERG does not test the function of the macula. So we need something else to test the macula. We can use multifocal ERG, which is a luminance stimulus. Our preferred method of morphils is a pattern ERG, where we use a contrast stimulus. So we have a checkerboard which is reversing. Black spurs become white, white spurs become black. These are small signals, ERGs, are hundreds of microvolts, pattern ERGs are less than 20 microvolts. So technical factors are important, but once they are taken into account, trial to trial, test retest variability, is just like a full field ERG. And most of the pattern ERG, or at least 70% of P50 and all of N95, is generated in the retinal ganglion cells, but P50 is driven by the macular photoreceptors and acts objectively as a measure of the function of the macula. I'm going to start with this case. It was a patient who's got a history of a traumatic optic neuropathy. The patient was in a car crash and then comes to us with one year history of difficulty seeing at night. And the right thumb that shows a pale disc, there's loss of the ganglion cells on OCT, and this is in keeping with a traumatic optic neuropathy, and the retina otherwise looks normal. The left eye is completely normal. When we do the electrophysiology, the VEP from the right eye is undetectable to a pattern, it's very poorly formed with a flash. And the pattern ERG shows a P50 component driven by the macula, which is relatively good, and loss of the ganglion cell-derived N95 component, and this is in keeping with a traumatic optic neuropathy. The left eye is completely normal. But when we look at retinal function, the rod-specific ERG, the dim flash under dark adaptation, is completely undetectable. And the bright flash dark adapted ERG is markedly subnormal. But we have to then ask the question, where is this signal coming from? So what are the origins in this patient of that response? Are we looking at reduced rod function, or are we looking at no rod function with the signals coming from remaining dark adapted cones? And that has important implications 
for the underlying pathophysiology. When you do an ERG, you have to ask these three questions. Where in the retina are the signals coming from? How do the ERGs relate to the underlying pathophysiology? And can the ISF standard ERGs actually answer the question that you seek an answer to? And in this instance, we use a red flash under dark adaptation. We get an early component from dark adapted cones, a late component from rods. And in the patient, we see a cone component, but no rod component whatsoever. So this patient has a cone-isolated retina to explain the problems with dark adaptation. We were given no history. My technicians always take a full history, and it turned out the patient had had a Whipple procedure. If you've had a Whipple procedure, you lose pancreatic function, you lose digestive enzymes, you lose the ability to absorb the fat-soluble vitamins. So this patient has vitamin A deficiency until proven otherwise. Now, for me as an electrophysiologist, this is fantastic because vitamin A deficiency is treatable. Most of the disorders I see are not. So the patient gets given vitamin A, intramuscular injection, complete restoration of retinal function, diagnosis established, underlying pathophysiology confirmed. You will see the same phenomenon in patients with Crohn's disease who've had bowel resections and patients with bariatric surgery. And the general surgeon sometimes forget that it might take a year or so before the vitamin A levels get depleted. Now this is a patient who's got <coughs> melanoma-associated retinopathy. It's one of the paraneoplastic syndromes. And there's both melanoma and carcinoma-associated retinopathy. Ma tends to present with an acquired night blindness and shimmering photopsias. They have a history of cutaneous malignant melanoma. Occasionally you'll see cells in the vitreous, but not very much. We know that it's a bipolar cell disease on immunocytochemistry, and the ERG is characteristic of loss of all on-pathway function because of loss of synaptic transmission. And some of this, at least, is mediated through TRPM1, which is the cause of recessive congenital stationary night blindness. And this is a typical patient. The patient's got a history of malignant melanoma and comes in with a sudden onset, and this is usually sudden, of night blindness and shimmering photopsias. There's a history. Color vision, this is proton, deuton, triton axis, so heavily elevated in the triton axis because the S cones only have an on pathway. And when we look at the ERG, the broad specific ERG is undetectable, as it was before, but this time when we use the bright flash, we have a profoundly electronegative waveform. The normal A wave confirms that there is normal photoreceptor function, and the negative wave shape with the B wave being smaller than the A wave confirms this is inner retinal disease. There's a characteristic shape in the single flash photopic ERG, with the A wave being broadened, the B wave sharply rising, reduced B to A ratio. And this is diagnostic of loss of the on pathway, preservation of the off pathway within the cone system. And this is complete loss of on pathway. And if you want to look at on pathways and on and off responses in S cone ERGs, they're gone too. And this is exactly the same as you would get with a complete congenital stationary night blindness emphasizing again the importance of history taking. Carcinoma associated retinopathy is a different animal. It's rapid, it's painless, but usually associated with photopsias. Symptoms are usually bilateral, it's rapidly progressive, with restricted fields. Initially, the fundus will be normal, but that will change with disease. And the treatment options for prognosis of the car itself are extremely poor. But what's really important is that the symptoms of CAR may precede the diagnosis of the underlying malignancy. And early diagnosis, therefore, can save the life of the patient with appropriate ERG. So ERG can be life-saving. We know that there are antiretinal antibodies. Recoverin, enolase, recoverin's global. Enolase tends to go to the cones, and they introduce apoptosis. And you need to be cautious if you do bloods for antiretinal antibodies, even if you get them as positive, there is an association you don't know whether they're causative or whether it's a reactive epiphenomenon to what's going on in the retina. So you need to treat the investigation with caution. Now this is a patient who came into us. She's 59 years of age. She's got post-viral photopsias and acquired night blindness. And she's got a little bit of fluid in the posterior pole. And she's got very constricted fields. Her history was otherwise unremarkable. When we looked at the autofluorescence, we got a shock because we'd never seen any autofluorescence like this. And we assumed, as it turns out wrongly, that these dark areas were bad. I remember discussing them with Alan Bird, and Alan said, bloody hell, what's that, when he looked at the dark areas? And there's big cystoid macular edema with a lovely petaloid appearance. When we looked at the electrophysiology, there's massive generalized retinal dysfunction at the level of the first receptor. It's worse in the right eye than the left. The EOG 
Findings about the interaction between RPE and fetal sex is down. So this could be an azure-type phenomenon. It's global. But as soon as you've got anything which suggests autoimmune, you have to do a full systems review. But what about the autofluorescence? Well, when we looked at multifocal ERGs and compared it with the fields, it showed us that the dark areas, in fact, had function. We got that completely wrong. We thought they were the bad bits. They're the good bits. And that can be shown by microperimetry, where you see normal thresholds over the dark areas. And note that even over the cystoid macular edema, you have normal thresholds because cystoid macular edema elevates the photoreceptors. It doesn't stop them responding to light. The history was revived, was reviewed completely, and the patient had vaginal bleeding. She was under Obsengayani, who told her not to worry. We told them to worry. They found out cancer markers. They did urgent hysterectomy, and the patient had a small cell and endometrial carcinoma. And she has CAR. John Hecken lively did some Western blots, and there is an anti recovering band at 23 kilodaltons, so she has CAR. This is a patient who's 13 years of age, comes in from elsewhere, said originally to have a normal macula, and comes in with a cloud in his vision of his left eye. On direct questioning, you've got occasional problems with bright light, but it's mostly fine. No relevant medical history. Fundus was said to be initially normal. When he comes to us, he's got a lesion which is clearly seen in the left macula. And then when you look at the autofluorescence, you can see it's a bullseye type lesion. And then when you look at the OCT, you see there's massive loss of structure in central areas. And then it looks when you go to peripheral macular areas and further out that there's preservation of outer retina. Of course, OCT doesn't tell us about function, and it only tells us about central retina. It doesn't tell us what's going on in the periphery. When we did function in this patient, the patient's got completely normal rods in the left eye, but zero cones. So this patient has totally lost cone function in his left eye. The only abnormality that you see is focal disruption of the OCT at the macula, and yet there's no cone function whatsoever. We have no explanation for this whatsoever. We don't know what it is. We've done the anti retinal anti Study, antibody studies which didn't really show very much and we presume that this is autoimmune retinopathy until proven otherwise because we can't think of another mechanism which would take away cone function completely and preserve rod function. Now even when you've got a history which is suggestive you still sometimes find that you won't get things right. This is a patient who's got deterioration of vision which is two months history. She's got positive phenomena She's down to no light perception and counting fingers, a history of what was said to be adult to telephone dystrophy that looks more like a macular hole, and she's got the double whammy of malignancy. She's had carcinoma of the breast with recurrence, and she's also had lymphoma. And she came to us having had a normal CT head elsewhere with a presumed diagnosis of carcinoma-associated retinopathy. The OCT, as I say, looks more like a macular hole. The other eye is completely normal. Fundus is otherwise unremarkable. And when we did the ERGs, much to my surprise, they're completely normal. So there's no retinal function abnormality whatsoever. We did VEPs and patent ERGs. The VEPs were largely undetectable, and there was sufficient vision in the counting finger's eye for her to maintain fixation on the pattern that she's asking to look at. She couldn't see the pattern, but she could maintain fixation. We were therefore able to record a patent ERG P50 component showing that the macular function is intact, and there was loss of the N95 component, suggesting this is post-retinal and probably optic nerve disease. Flash VEPs were also un uh, undetectable. And then when she had a decent MR, she actually had chias uh, carcinomas as meningitis with chiasmal infiltration. And this is one of the rare cases where a patient with carcinomas as meningitis presents with visual loss. So what I've tried to do in this short period of time is demonstrate the way that we can use electrophysiology objectively to look at the function of the retina. We can separate the function of the rod and the cone systems. We can separate photoreceptor disease from intraretinal disease. And accurate history taking is absolutely essential. Bill emphasized that at the beginning. I will emphasize this again. You really do need to ask the specific questions. What medication have been people taking? What operations have they had, etc. We can objectively demonstrate function, and there may not be a structural correlate of that. Just because somebody images normally, it doesn't mean they function normally. And any suspicion whatsoever of autoimmune disease, or possibly neoplastic, paraneoplastic, you must institute a full intensive review of systems, get PET scans done, refer to the internists, etc. 
Thank you very much indeed. Okay, we have time for one question. Can you explain to us, is there still a role for a full field ERG versus pattern versus multifocal? Uh, yes, because the full field is the only one which gives you global retinal function. Multifocal looks at central cone function within 55 degrees, doesn't address the peripheral cones. So you can have massive cone dysfunction and not see it very much on a multifocal. Pattern ERG is a contrast response of the macula. Multifocal ERG is a luminance response, so they're giving you different information. And the other advantage of the pattern ERG is that it directly measures ganglion cell function. So you can't do a, a multifocal ERG without a full field ERG is a bad thing to do. Okay. Good. Other questions to the audience? That was great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, now we're going to.